Welcome to Victory Church Craddock. Please don't forget to like, subscribe and hit the notification bell. The Bible talks about how God uses the weak and foolish things. And if he used the things that we're good at to advance his kingdom, we would be so filled up with pride and we would keep all the glory for ourselves. But he doesn't do that. He uses the weak and foolish things. And for me, if you asked me two or three years ago, like, go and preach, I would have said, you are crazy. (laughs) There's no way. I want to be a physio. I want to have a practice. This is what I want to do. But God had, like, a really big encounter with me and just completely changed my heart. And so he's using, like, speaking in front of people was one of my weakest things. Like, I would have stomach issues before I would do an oral in class. That's how bad it was. I was the shy girl, and so God is using my weakness to show off his strength. Amen? Because this is not me. This is God. So all the glory to God. Um, Yeah, when we are weak, he is strong. Um, There's been many prophetic words spoken over Gradoch, right, and over our church. And the one thing that really sticks with me is that Gradoch is going to be the epicenter of revival for our nation. I mean, for this nation, that it's going to start here and it's going to seep into communities and into other towns and other provinces, and it's going to, like, shake our nation. Like, that gets me excited because we are in Gradoch. (laughs) Okay? So I said to God, I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land that I'm living in. Psalm 27, verse 13. Okay. So we prophesy that while I'm still alive, that is going to happen. Like, we're going to, yes, while William is still alive, we are expecting to see it. And God said to me, it's going to be soon. It's not going to be long. Okay. So um, those of you who don't know, we are living in the end times. You can see it all over the news and all over social media. And that's what the Bible says. Okay, and Jesus is coming back. And the time is now. Like, there is no more time to waste time. (laughs) Like, I said to the Lord, I leave all mediocrity behind. I do not want to be a superficial Christian that, that serves you just on a Sunday morning and on a Tuesday night at life group. It's not going to work for me. Like, I want to be right up in the front. I want to see everything happen because it makes me so excited. Right. He is a good God, and he's ready to lavish us with his love. Amen. Um, So I also believe that God is raising up his end-time church. And we are part of that. That is now. And the perfect example we have for the end-time church, I believe it's going to look like the Church of Acts. It has to, because the Church of Acts is the only, like, example we have of church. Who've read the book of Acts? That maybe you should not put up your hand. (laughs) Um, It's one of my favorite books in the Bible, because God just puts his full power and might on display. Amen? And that is what he wants to do in his end-time church. Every time I go into prayer, God says this to me. He says to me, Irene, I'm cleaning house. I'm preparing my bride. I'm cleaning vessels. I I want a bride that is pure and spotless and holy before me, that can stand before me with surrendered, humble hearts, ready to do whatever I ask them to do. And so I want to be part of that. God, God, just humble me. And this has been a completely, this is me being humble. Like, this was such a humbling process for me. It took a lot of sacrifice and pushing down fear of man and getting rid of all those other stuff that doesn't bear fruit. So, um, yeah, I was asking the Lord, what is it going to take? What is it going to take for us to be the end time church? And he gave me this verse. (laughs) Amen. And so I'm going to just put it up here. It says, yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshipers, true worshipers, will worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is spirit and his worshipers must worship him in spirit and in truth. Okay? It's one thing to worship God in spirit. It's another thing to worship him in truth. And I was asking him, like, what does this mean? 
And then he said to me, the word truth actually refers to the word transparency. Are you standing before God, worshiping him in spirit, transparent before him? Because transparency requires a lot of humility. Like you need to be humble to allow God to come in and see in the deepest, darkest spaces of your heart. And that's hard. It's in this transparency where we take the power of the enemy away. Because the moment we expose him and his work in our life, he has to go. He must flee. Like, immediately, because he cannot operate in the light. So that's the truth of transparency, all right? So when you walk with God and you have a true relationship with him, you have to change. You have to change. There is no way you can be in the presence of God and live unchanged. Because that's his nature. It's what he does. It's who he is as a father. He makes everything new. The moment we come in contact with him, he has to change you. And that change is not easy. It's not lacquer. But that's what Christianity is. Becoming more and more like Jesus every single day. I see many Christians, I, I I come in, in people's homes and they confess with their mouths that they're Christians, but their life don't show that. Like if you worship the Lord in spirit and in truth, the fruits need to be evident in your life. You have to bear fruit. If, it, if you don't, like, what's going on in your heart? Are you being fully transparent? Because fruits is evidence of the Holy Spirit working in you. When you're transparent, you say yes to God. You allow the Holy Spirit to come in and do the work that's necessary to prepare the bride, to make us more and more like Jesus. And that's what it's about. So if you're not transparent, what are you? Um, Maybe filled with pride? Because... Pride keeps you away from God. It's a very, very stubborn demon. (laughs) It's a very stubborn spirit. And it keeps you away from serving God in all the fullness that you can. So I'm going to elaborate a little bit on what pride is, but mostly I'm going to talk about humility and what that unlocks for us in the kingdom. Amen? So pride is the root of everything evil. Most people do not even consider themselves pride or vulnerable to pride. And that is pride in itself. Okay? So pride was one of the first sins. Lucifer was an angel that God created beautifully, and he wanted to bear glory. People and beings were not created to bear glory. Only God can bear glory. We weren't created to carry that. It's too much for us. Okay? And so he got thrown out of heaven because of his pride, And Adam and Eve also had pride in their hearts. We go back to the garden. God hates pride. This feast like yellow. (laughs) That does not yarn of word me. So God hard work moet. I I hard it. And us moet leer om dit wat God hard, ons moet dit ook hard. We need to learn to hate what God hates and love what God loves. Amen. So, Psalm 10 verse 3 to 4 says, A prideful man has God in none of his thoughts. Like, that's quite hectic. A prideful man has God in none of his thoughts. Pride is deceptive. The devil's not going to come running up to you, bearing like a red flag, going, Oh, you have pride, you have pride. He hides behind it and makes you think, that you do not have to confess anything, you do not have to repent, because you know what? You are just, you've arrived, and you can do it by yourself. <laughs> and he hides behind that. It actually says, I've been reading a few books on deliverance, and every time they speak on the spirit of pride, they actually say that that spirit uses other spirits to shield itself. It hides. And that creates dark spaces in our hearts where stuff hides, where gunk hides. Amen? It says that Proverbs 16, verse 18 says, wait, I just want to skip here. Listen to what this says. Jeremiah 49, verse 16 says that the terror you inspire in the pride of your heart have deceived you. You who live in the clefts of the rocks and occupy the heights of the hills, though you build your nest as high as the eagles, from there the Lord will bring you down. 
And Proverbs 16 verse 18 says that pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before the fall. Okay? So pride leaves a trail of destruction wherever you go. It causes pain in your life and in the people around you. I'm going to just talk about a few manifestations of the spirit of pride. There was like a list of 50, guys, I promise you. I had to sit, I was like, Lord, I want to say everything, but I can't say all 50. So God highlighted a few to me that I feel a lot of us actually struggle with. The first one is pride manifests through the tongue. From the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Boasting, lying, disputing, arguing, we dismissive, cursing, speaking harshly of others. Pride will always exalt self. Okay? The second one is anger and stirring up strife. And that speaks enough in itself. <laughs> Three, stubbornness and rebellion. That is the refusal to change. This causes man to reject the word of God and rejecting the Holy Spirit is a rejection of the truth. We cannot grow spiritually without changing. We must change to become more and more like Jesus. And pride hinders this growth. It leads to anti-submissiveness and being unteachable, being set in your ways. (laughs) Number four, hardness of heart. It prevents you, and that's actually, that's what I'm talking about when I'm referring to the scripture at the back here. Is your heart being transparent or is it clip heart, sticky clip? (laughs) Hardness of heart. It prevents you from walking in the fullness of God's blessing. Pride hinders all spiritual growth. It blocks a person from actually flowing and operating in the gifts of the Spirit. Proud people don't see the need to pray or seek God. An inability to remember Scripture. It causes problematic prayer lives and brings forth problems understanding the Word. It's hectic. It actually says in this book that people that have a spirit of pride, they would fall asleep when they try to pray. Or you sit in church, but you fall asleep in church. (laughs) You can't listen. And that's actually that spirit trying to not let the stuff go in your heart. Okay. You're not sleeping. (laughs) All right. It leads to relational problems, unbelief, doubt, lack of repentance, ungodly sorrow, backsliding and departing from God. And then number five is religious pride. That's a hard one because we all want to say that my church has all the truth. No man and no church has all the truth. This is the truth. It's the only truth. Pride actually causes you to reject healing. It causes you to reject your deliverance. Even some people reject baptism and baptism of the Holy Spirit because of pride. It keeps you from walking in the fullness of the blessing of the new covenant that we have with Jesus. And we spoke about that this morning. I want to read something that Henford and I had such a laugh last night because I read this to him and we laughed so much because it's in all of us. It says that I'm self-sufficient in the way that I live my life. I don't live with the constant awareness that my every breath depends upon God. I tend to think I have enough strength, ability, and wisdom to live and manage my life. My practice of spiritual discipline is inconsistent and superficial, and I don't ask others for help. And the second one is the best. I really appreciate the person putting this together. It really is a big help to my friends and my family. However, I don't think I need it because I think I'm pretty humble. (laughs) Okay, so if that went through your mind, we need to start thinking about the spirit of pride. God is not out to hurt your pride. He's out to kill your pride. (laughs) He wants to, like, step on that thing's head forever. Okay? All right. Now, let's look at what humility is. The beginning of humility is recognizing our limitations and inability. It's recognizing our dependence on the Lord, a humble man recognizing his need for God in everything that he does. That's humility. I want to say something to you tonight. Don't ask God to make you humble. (laughs) You have to make yourself humble. humble. Humility is not a feeling. It's a choice of the free will to act and think differently. I'm quickly going to read James 4, 
That's, oh, James is a lucky book, huh? If God takes you to James, you, you leave there. <laughs> You're like, oof, convicted. <laughs> Lord, set me free again. All right. Let's just keep your eye on there. I put it up there because it was so funny. All right, so I'm not going to read the whole book of the whole scripture, but the beginning of verse 4, it actually talks about the spirit of pride that's manifesting in a person, just exactly what we talked about right now. <clears throat> and when you read on, you say, it says that, um, don't you know that flirting with the world, it actually calls a, 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 a spirit that, a person that has pride, they call you spiritual adulterers. Because you have your one foot with the world, but you have your other foot with the Lord. So it says actually that you do not get what you ask for because you don't ask God. And when you do ask, you ask with the wrong motives. Don't you know that flirting with the world places you at odds with God? Whoever chooses to be a world friend makes himself God's enemy. And then it says, I love this, this is so beautiful. The spirit of God that breathed into your hearts is a jealous lover who instantly desires to have more and more of us. That's his heart. He wants to have more and more and more and more and more and more and more. But it says, listen to this, God resists you when you are proud, but he continually pours out grace and grace and grace and grace when you are humble. So then, surrender to God, humble yourself. And this is where I'm, this is getting good now. <laughs> Stand up to the devil, and he will flee from you. So humility is actually in our spiritual warfare. Because the moment we humble ourselves, now the devil run away. Now we can truly repent before God. We can receive our full salvation, deliverance, whatever we need, healing, whatever that might be that you need from God. You can now receive it, but God requires you to humble yourself so that he can draw near to you. And the devil can run. One translation says, he runs away in agony. <laughs> and I like that. <clears throat> it says, move your heart closer and closer to God, and he will move closer and closer to you. But make sure you cleanse your life, you sinners, and keep your heart pure and stop doubting. Feel the pain of your sin. So they're telling us to feel, be sorrowful, repent, weep. Let your joking around be turned into mourning and your joy into humiliation. Be willing to be made low with God and he will lift you up. It's an upside down kingdom, guys. The way up is the way down. Humble yourself and you will be exalted. Exalt yourself and God will find a way to humble you. I love that thing that humility is spiritual warfare. It opened up so much of the spiritual realm to me. Because now when, when, when we become humble, the enemy cannot hide in those places anymore. We expose him, and he has to go. Demons need to go. Sickness needs to go. Whatever is not from God needs to go when we expose it. So tonight I want you to be open and honest and transparent about your life before the Lord. Okay. I just want to quickly read a little bit of Psalm 51, because it's such a beautiful chapter. It says, David's like really repenting. He says, um, I know that you delight to set your truth into my spirit. So come into the hidden places of my heart and teach me wisdom. Hey, that requires a humble heart. And it goes on and he says at the end, um, for the source of your pleasure is not in my performance. All the sacrifices that I offer to you, the fountain of your pleasure is found in the sacrifice of my shattered heart before you. You will not despise my tenderness as I humbly bow down at your feet. It's good stuff. I never even read Peter. It's all right. Okay. I want to say this to you that William preached on it last week and this week about unwavering faith, how God wants us to live in abundance. That's his heart for you. It's always been his heart for you to be free, to be healed, to be successful, to live an abundant life. That's his heart for us. And if it wasn't his heart, then Jesus died for nothing. 
This is the benefit of walking in covenant with him. Humility unlocks his mercy, favor, and grace over our lives, and we start to live on earth as in heaven. Humility is like our key to freedom. Whatever you want from the Lord, like if you humble yourself, God will provide. Right. Um, so when we humble ourselves and the enemy has fled, and now we're in this position where we're like, we can now truly repent. Okay, this is true repentance. So that he can use you now as a clean vessel to advance his kingdom. His heart is also for you to live in abundance. And then I said, yeah, when we become humble, he now reveals a big secret in his kingdom to us. He shows us that we carry authority. I'm going to quickly read Luke 10, then you will understand what I mean. Right. Luke 10. I love this. This is my new favorite verse. I have a few, but this is mine. Hey? For this week. Next week, there'll be another one. <laughs> All right. So Jesus has sent out 70 missionaries, and they return, and they are like, they're like so joyful. They can't believe what happened to them. They've like cast out demons, healed sick people. They are like, what? Can we do this? Like, who thought? Who thought? Me? So Jesus replied, and he says, they say, they say actually to the Lord, Lord, even the demons obeyed us when we commanded them in your name. And Jesus replied, while you were ministering, I watched Satan topple until he fell suddenly from heaven like lightning to the ground while they were ministering. Hey, now understand that I have imparted into you all my authority to trample over his kingdom. You will trample upon every demon before you and overcome every power Satan possesses. That deserves a clap. Amen. Absolutely nothing will be able to harm you as you walk in this authority. However, your real source of joy on this heart is not that these demons obey you, but that your names are written in heaven's journals. That's the joy that we've been saved. Amen? That's where our joy is, and that's also where our authority is. Then Jesus was also overflowing with the Holy Spirit's anointing of joy, and he exclaimed, Father, thank you. You are Lord supreme over heaven and earth, and you have hidden this great revelation of this authority from those who are proud in their own eyes. Wise in their own eyes. You have shared it with these who have humbled themselves. Yes, Father, this is what pleases your heart. The very way you've chosen to extend your kingdom is to give it to those who have been calm like trusting children. Hey, that's amazing. So yes, we carry authority to trample on the head of the enemy. Yesterday morning, I got so fired up because I was like practicing my, <laughs> my sermon. And I was like, Satan, there's a storm coming. <laughs> Pack your bags because I'm going to bring Holy Spirit fire on you tonight. I don't care if we're three people or one people, there's no space. <laughs> one person, sorry. One person. See, I'm getting excited now. I believe that God is so eager to pour out like a new measure of anointing over our church. Hey? Like in the spiritual realm, I see like this balloon that's like filled with water. And he's like, he just wants to pour it out on us for us to do the miraculous, to lead thousands of people to Christ. But we just need a tiny little pin to pop it, and that's humility. Right? So if we, and I, oh my word. God doesn't pour this out on anyone. He's not going to supernaturally equip you if he doesn't see that he can trust you. He needs to know that you're humble. Like, and when he sees he can trust you, like he gives it to you. But it's sacred. It, it needs to be stewarded well. You can't just, you know, like, he needs to know that he can trust you to give it to you and that you're going to advance his kingdom and not yourself and not your own reputation because it's not about us. I must decrease, he must increase. Say that with me. I must decrease, he must increase. John 3 verse 30. 
If we look at the Church of Acts, like in verse 2, Peter is preaching up a storm. They've just been filled with the Holy Spirit. All of them are speaking in tongues. Peter is like, Peter's my favorite disciple. Peter's preaching up a storm, okay? And it actually says that in one day, 3,000 people came to know Christ. They were revelation, they received the revelation, they were baptized, they were added to the church. And we wait six months to decide whether or not we want to be baptized because we're uncomfortable. <laughs> like, guys, if you, if you understand the full revelation of what Jesus did for you on the cross, you will do everything right now. Like, Lord, yes, I want to be baptized, I want to be filled with the Holy Spirit, I want to go out, I want to cast out demons, heal the sick. Like, I just want to do everything because you give me the ability to do it. And because you died for me on the cross, I can do this. And each one of us, God has that in store for each and every one of us because our names are written in heaven's journals. Like, it's not only a few people, all of us. If you look at the church of Acts, I, I asked the Lord, like, what did they, like, what were they different than ours? They were humble. They were completely humble. And God knew that he could trust them, the disciples and the apostles. He gave his anointing to them. He entrusted it to them because he knew that they were going to steward it. They were going to steward it well. Amen. And by God's supernatural anointing, Signs and wonders broke out. Thousands of people were saved, healed, set free. Isn't that beautiful? I'm so full of my notes now. I, just, I want to talk a little bit about Peter because he's my favorite. Peter denies Jesus three times. When he betrayed Jesus, that betrayal was rooted in pride. If it was rooted in humility, he probably would have been willing to die with Jesus. But he denied them. Because now he had fear. Because he didn't want to die. God had to take this out of him. It was in him. And God had to take this out of him so that God can use him in the Church of Acts. If this didn't happen to him, would God have been able to use him this mightily? I asked this question so many times. If he didn't betray Jesus, would God have called him to feed his sheep? Because in John 21, now Jesus meets them on the beach. Three days after he's, after he's resurrected, he meets them on a beach. And the Bible talks about how Jesus restores Peter. I mean, can you imagine the guilt and the shame this man must have been feeling in his heart? He knew he betrayed the Messiah. Not once. Not twice, but three times. I mean, he must have just, this thing humbled him to the bone. You see, this part that, that he, of this betrayal had to come out so that he could be a clean vessel, so that God could trust him. And if you turn to um, John, and how beautiful that Jesus restores him at the end of John, right before the book of Acts. Hey? Um, let me just. I'm almost finished, guys. <laughs> All right, so um, it says Jesus restores Peter. After they had breakfast, Peter, um, Jesus said to Peter, Simon, son of John, do you burn with love for me more than these? And Peter answered, Yes, Lord, you know that I, that I love you. And then Jesus says to him, Take care of my lambs. Jesus um, repeated this question a second time. Simon, son of John, do you burn with love for me? Yes. And so with every time Jesus asks him, feed my lambs, he restores him. Hey? He trusts him with the anointing. Take care of my sheep. And then Jesus asked him again, Peter, son of John, do you have great affection for me? And Peter was saddened by being asked the third time. But Jesus had to ask him three times. Because he was restoring in the spirit that what he, he sinned, he was restoring him. And then he prophesies over Peter the death that he would have. Do you think that Peter would have died that death if he had pride in his heart? 
because he was crucified upside down. He wouldn't. And he wouldn't have done half the things that he did in the Church of Acts. I mean, literally, his shadow would go over people and demons would go. Sickness would go. Just his shadow. I mean, he had to be an incredible, humble man. And none of them ever gave any glory to themselves. Ever. I'm going to end with this. And I was asking the Lord, should I say this? But I do feel like this is going to be a burning bush moment for someone. (laughs) I'm going to talk quickly, jump to Moses, okay? We're in Exodus 3. Moses is in the in the in the in the desert. He's tending his father's in law in law's flock of sheep. Okay? And an angel appears to him in a burning bush. Okay, so this was not a tiny bossy. That was just a boss. Okay, because the Lord wanted to get his attention. God is a gentleman. He doesn't force himself on us. And so God wanted to see that Moses actually responds. Okay? So the, bur- the bush is burning, and Moses actually says, it's weird, because it says in the Bible that Moses spoke out and said, I will now turn aside to see why this bush is burning. I mean, he could have just walked straight on and not... And he would have missed his whole schooling. And so tonight, like, turn and see. Turn and see the burning bush. And then as soon as God, it said, as soon as God saw Moses turn to see the bush, he spoke. He said, Moses, Moses. And Moses fell to his knees and he said, yes, Lord, here I am. And then God said to him, take off your sandals. Because the ground where you're standing on is holy. And it says that Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at the Lord. So I want to say to you tonight, Victory Church, Braddock, take off your sandals. Because the ground you're standing on is holy. This is holy ground. God is not a God to be messed with. He's a good God. But he's also a God of justice and he wants all of us. He's a jealous lover that wants all of us.